Welcome to Vlada's Seeds of Life. I'm truly glad that you are with me today because I have a very unique place and person I want you to meet. My mission to produce quality educational cooking program for children and young families brought me to Leonez Vinery and more importantly to their executive chef Dara Matson. It was a great pleasure and privilege to be in a company of one of the best chefs in America today. Chef Dara was gracious enough to donate his time and skills during the filming of one of the Cooking and Kids episodes. But most importantly, he open-heartedly share his opinions on a current food crisis in America. In Temecula's wine country, Chef Dara is well known for his passion for all natural and all from scratch cuisine. After exchanging thoughts and ideas on how to bring healthier food back to American table, it was time to get to kitchen. For this episode of Cooking and Kids, I asked Chef Dara to show children and young families how easily they can prepare nutritious breakfast. It was wonderful to observe a master in motion, and even better to try his masterpiece. After finishing the cooking portion of the program, I wanted to sit down and have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with Chef Dara. Now that was fun. Okay. It was a hard work, so I think we deserve a glass of cold wine. Okay, All I right? agree. So this is uh, our 2014 Viognier, which is a nice, uh, again, we, we were talking about balance earlier. This is a nice wine and would actually pair very well with that uh, smoked salmon omelet. Uh -huh. So we've got a little bit of acidity and it's balanced out with a little bit of sweetness, need not too much of either. Uh, it's nice and crisp, a little bit grassy. Grassy? Did a little bit grassy. grassy? Yeah, a little bit grassy. Oh, okay. Let's see. A little bit of grapefruit. Oh. <laughs> it's not citrusy, but yet it has the, it ha the, with the fish, I can see why, why it would go so well with salmon. It's a nice balance. It has the <clears throat> freshness. No, it's very fresh. Very, yep. very fresh. Excellent. It's very fragrant too. Perfect for a nice warm mm -hmm. summer's day in Southern California. Wonderful. Well, before I have too much of this wine, I need to ask you a few serious questions. All right, so um, we made an omelette, but I do want our young viewers to know how accomplished you truly are, so they know that the recipe came from uh, um, from somebody who knows what he's doing in his uh, field. So okay. tell us about <clears throat> you. Well, I've been cooking professionally since I was 15, so this is my uh, 30th year. I'm 45 this year. 30th so year. 30 years. Yes. And I started out with uh, what, what would be an associate's degree and I went to culinary college for three years. So I did a, a trade school first for one year and then I did a culinary school for two years. And then I went to Australia and I worked there for uh, two years and then I came back to Ireland and then I arrived in the United States in 2003. And since then I've done my bachelor's degree in culinary arts. I'm doing a master's degree in business right now. And I'm a certified executive chef with the American Culinary Federation and a certified executive, sorry, a certified culinary educator also with the American Economy Federation. So you're educating young, uh, young chefs, yes. future chefs? Yeah. So I've been a teacher at the Art Institute for four, four and a half years. So, uh, so it's been really interesting to, to watch somebody come into the culinary school with not li much experience and then watch them leave. And actually I have uh, 10 of my students actually work in this kitchen. And I have another kitchen in, in Temecula where I have another 10 students who also work down there. So, so uh, you know that one of the reasons we cook today was to encourage young families of and course. children to mm -hmm. get back to the kitchen. Uh, childhood obesity in America weighs heavily on my heart and heavily on this country. So um, I believe that ordinary, it's going to take ordinary people to make the change. So what do you think, what is it that we can do as ordinary people, families, chefs, to change the, the, the current uh, ads add um, odds on childhood obesity. Okay, that's a, that's a really uh, multifaceted question. It sure is. So I, I think there's a, lot of, there's a lot of different things that we have, to, we have to take into account when we're talking about childhood obesity. So one of the things is that food is a reward system. So we're designed to go and look for food to either hunt for it or forage for it. And at the end of that process, then we, we actually eat it. That's, the, really that's how it's, it's supposed to work. So the difficulty now is that we have so many restaurants that we can just, anywhere we go, anywhere in, in the United States, you're never far from a restaurant. And a lot of
lot of them you can smell the food permeating through the air and, and even if you're not hungry sometimes that makes you hungry. So I think the difficulty is, is that we have so much access to food and we're not actually doing anything to get that food. So we're not rewarding ourselves by going to a restaurant. We have to get we have to get into the kitchen. We have to cook it ourselves. We have to spend energy before we can actually, you know, we have to expend some energy cooking the food before we can eat the food so that it's all balanced out. And right now we, we don't seem to be doing that. Okay, and when we talk about the uh, food quality, uh, what are you, I mean you're from Ireland, you're yeah. from a different mm -hmm. uh, culture and obviously with every culture it, there's a different food. Of course. Uh, when you observe the food in America, um, what do you what do you see? Um, I noticed when I came here in 2003 that most of the foods that I ate were very sugar rich. So there's a lot of sugar in, in foods that there's not typically supposed to be sugar in. So bread was an example. I, I, when I went to the store and I tried to get a bread, and I'm actually uh, gluten intolerant, so I don't eat a lot of bread. Um, I I couldn't believe how many breads had sugar in it, and all the salad dressings have sugar in them, and things that you shouldn't have necessarily sugar in them have sugar in them. So I think that I think that's one of the main problems is that the food manufacturers, the processors, they put a lot of sugar into food, which is instantaneously addictive, which obviously makes for better food sales. So, uh, beside the fact that food is uh, accessible so easily, it's fairly cheap, especially the bad food, if, yeah. if you will, the fast food, and the, the uh, food that's heavily processed, there's so much sugar added to, to uh, these foods. You see those are two problems. How can we change that, and what do you think will, will take to, to offset all this? I mean, are you noticing that people are more interested into eating whole Healthier, or what can be done? I, I think again, it's there's so many uh, facets to that question. I think yes, we do need to eat healthier, and I think that we need to step away from processed foods, which we know. Um, I think many people are now starting to realize that fat's not your enemy as much as sugar is. So I think there's so many things that we need to address, and I also think that the uh, the nutrients, the quality of ingredient that yes. we're using, obviously makes a huge difference. And sometimes, you, especially with the food business, you have to put a little bit more in to be able to get the benefit back out. Yes. Sir. So I, I always find it interesting that people will put 93 octane in their in their cars to make sure that their cars are taken care of, but then they'll eat fast food. So they'll they'll take care of their cars, but they don't take care of their own bodies, <laughs> yes. which I think is quite funny. <clears throat> uh, I, I often thought about that. Uh, people will put a very good uh, oil yeah. uh, in their motor, and yes, they will eat whatever fat. And I'm right. thinking, why not invest a little bit in a good olive oil for your salad? I mean, right. just think about it, because that to me that's very important. Of course, I I also think it's difficult because food is is a gratification system so we eat food to instantly gratify ourselves to reward ourselves and I think that also we we have to be realistic and you can't eat for enjoyment every single meal you can't eat for enjoyment every single day sometimes you have to eat for fuel which isn't always what you want and sometimes it might not taste as good but it's good for your body yeah. and I think maybe it's a good system to, to reward yourself at the weekend and eat for eat for the love of food maybe on Saturday and Sunday but then on Monday Tuesday Wednesday Thursday you eat purely for fuel I like that did you hear this guys <clears throat> It's uh, reward yourself. On the weekends, eat for pleasure of it, and the rest of the time, eat for the efficiency of it. Exactly. Right? Exactly. <laughs> I like the idea. So, a bunch of kids will be watching this, uh -huh. and uh, what is your message to children? If you if you have a little girl and boy on the other side of the of the screen, what would you tell them? What is the one thing to stick to as they're growing up? What is the one thing they can do for themselves? Because um, Obviously, as a society, we are failing them. Parents are too busy. But yet, there are a lot of things that kids can do themselves. Because I was 10 years old, I was baking bread and cooking and doing a lot of things. So I know kids are capable at early age to start cooking. So what is the one thing that you can tell them to encourage them to, to step up I think cook. explore. I think you have to explore. And I think also for parents, you made a good point that, you know, we used to be able to do things. And I think now we're so protective of our children and maybe they're going to get burnt or maybe they might splatter on them yes. or cut their hands. And that's a process and that's part of learning. And that's part of, I can't tell you how many times I cut my hands and burnt myself, but you learn from those mistakes. And I think that it's important that kids are allowed to get into a kitchen and make, make mistakes, make, you know, make food, make mistakes. It's an enjoyable process. And at yeah. the end of it, you get to enjoy something that you've managed manufactured and I think that once you once you see how great that can be and you can sit there and enjoy with your family something that you've made it's a very rewarding thing to be able to do so can we say safely to children lead just lead Absolutely. your parents Absolutely. If your parents are too busy you just lead and say mom dad in a kitchen we're not gonna cook Let's Absolutely. Do this. 
Absolutely. Yeah. You know, there's there's nothing wrong with your children being able to do things while you're while you're busy doing other things. And as you said, we lead busy lives now, and it's difficult for parents to be able to work eight or nine or ten hours and then come home and, and feed their kids. But of course, that's what needs to happen. We need to be able to feed our children because if you're buying processed foods all the time, we're not making the decision on what they should eat. The manufacturers making yes, the decision yes, on what they yes. should eat. And that is one of the biggest problems. Of course, today, because uh, manufacturers are making decisions what is the best for our children. Of course. So that needs to change. Of it's course. A, we, and we as grown-ups have to be more responsible and kids too should be invited to be part of the solution. Of course. I also think we have to be realistic and you have to pay for what you're eating. And if you're looking at if you're looking at ingredients and you're looking at foods primarily from a pricing aspect, then you're always going to get the lowest the lowest quality ingredients. And I think for nutrition levels you have to you have to go for fresh and you have to buy more expensive ingredients to be able to get those nutrients. in Spain for the last three weeks and we couldn't get over how thin people were over there and they eat small amounts there's no there's no fast food restaurants anywhere so the biggest restaurant believe it or not is actually Burger King and they only sell 80 million dollars in Spain last year for the whole of Spain which is one of the largest populations so you look at how they eat and they eat completely differently and they eat small and little bits all the way through the day because when you eat food you don't get any nutrients from it. And so you're eating a lot So you more. eat more because yes. your brain says, oh, well, your body got fed, but I didn't get anything out of yes. it. So now your brain says to your body, well, now you need to consume more food because I didn't get anything from it. So then your body consumes more food, and that's why this, it becomes this process. It's now a it's a completely vicious circle. It is. It is. I, I, I do believe that if your body it receives the proper nu nutrition, it will just say, okay, I'm happy. Now move on to the next thing. And I have learned that <laughs> with myself. I, I don't stay away from, uh, there's nothing that's off of my menu. It's a moderation, it's natural, moderation, it's absolutely. easily processed, uh, nutrient rich, and I think that is the key to well-being, to obesity, and to many issues that are related to food today. Absolutely. I had a couple of uh, doctors in here who were food psychologists, and they were one of the, f the few people that I've actually met who's, who specialized in food psychology. And I asked them, you know, at what point does, at what point does somebody give up? Is it 300 pounds? Is it 400 pounds? If I, when do you just say, I'm so overweight now, it doesn't make any mm -hmm. difference? And they said it starts with a decision in the, in the morning. So if you wake up in the morning and you have something healthy, then you, you, you save that experience. And then when you come to lunch, then because you've had something for healthy for breakfast, you want to have something healthy for lunch. So now you have two experiences and it becomes like a bit. And then when you have come to dinner, you've had a healthy lunch and a healthy breakfast. So now you want to have a healthy dinner. And you wake up the next day and you continue that process. And then after a week, it becomes, I've eaten healthy for a week, so I want to keep eating healthy. And then it becomes a month and then it becomes a year and then it becomes a way of life. And the opposite, if you wake up in the morning and you have a really big fatty breakfast, then for lunch you think, well, I already had a fatty breakfast, so I'm just going to have a fatty lunch. And then you, you continue that process, and then you wake up the next day and you continue that process. And then a week becomes a month, a month becomes a year, and a year becomes a lifestyle. And then you break, you make that habit. So at that pivotal moment in making this Absolutely. one single decision that can Absolutely. lead to many other good Absolutely. decisions. Very good. And then you propagate that decision forward. So <clears throat> Now, uh, I want to hear a little bit about your childhood. Okay, okay, you come from Ireland. It's a different, different setting, mm -hmm. different place. Tell us about who you were as a boy. What is okay. it? What are the things that you <clears throat> dreamed about when you were just you know, running around your streets and whatever you were doing when you were? Um, I, I, well, you know, I, I love to say that I started out with a desert, but that's not what happened. Um, you know, I was a regular kid and looking for something to do. And I, I when it came to going to school, I, my mother, um, she used to entertain in our house all the time. And we used to sit upstairs in the bedroom and we'd have our ears planted on the floor and we'd be listening to all the conversation downstairs. So, so and you're telling me you were not allowed in a, a grown up? No. No. <laughs> No. The same thing was yeah. with me. <laughs> Grown-ups died, kids were Absolutely. sent yep. away. Yep. Oh, so my mother would feed us before before her guests arrived, yes. and then they'd light the fire open wide, and they'd have liqueurs, and they, all the guests would arrive in dinner jackets and ties and cocktail dresses, and there would be a pretty pretty big affair. There'd be maybe, maybe 10 or 12 people, and they'd sit up talking until 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. Kids were That's right. Did you hear that, kids? <clears throat> Kids were not included. I grew up that way too. So my mother used to bring us up a little bit of everything that she was making for downstairs uh -huh. so we could have a taste. And, and I remember as a child I wanted to be downstairs with all the adults and you know watching them, listening to the conversation. Then I, I think that's where I started to learn how to cook. And you know I really enjoyed watching how uh, people interacted with my mother because she always cooked really good food and she was a great entertainer. And they, my mother and my father worked really well as a pair. So I think that's where I got my... <coughs> so um, is it safe to say that you saw food was bringing people together? Did Absolutely. you like that aspect? I do, yeah. Okay. I think what I love about uh, how we dine in Europe is it's not it's not utilitarian like it is in the United States. Mm -hmm. So in the United States, people will arrive at a restaurant 
uh, whatever time they want to eat, and they want to eat right now. So if I'm hungry at six o'clock, then I want to go to a restaurant and I want to be fed at six o'clock. Whereas in Europe, it tends to be a little bit more uh, pre-planned. So you'll arrive at a restaurant a long time in advance of when you're going to eat, and it's a much slower process. So it takes maybe three or four, and sometimes it could take five hours. And it's very slow. It's very social, so it's not just we have one course here and then we go to another place for coffee and we go somewhere else for ice cream. In Europe, you tend to have five or six courses, and it's very it's very interactive social and it's very slow, yeah. and it's it's it, it's about as much about the company and the social integration of the people at the table as it is about the food. And I think I really enjoy that part of of having eat. I agree with that. <coughs> to me, I think the reason I love food and I love cooking is the same thought: it's people. Yeah. And uh, every time there was food in our in our house. Uh, we served countless people, strangers. You come, you eat. Yeah. And it was just a part of um, socializing, uh, sharing your blessings, feeling good, and just kind of announcing life is good. So I like that aspect. So when I cook, I think about life is good. And just that's the feeling that comes in. Yeah, yeah. of course. So, I'm sure yeah. you find that in, in your kitchen, when you're cooking, everybody wants the kitchen with yeah. you. Yeah. And I, I used to find when I cooked first, I'd cook in the kitchen, everybody would be in the dining room. And then I discovered that they all wanted to be in the kitchen, so they were more comfortable in the island. And yes. what are you doing? And what are you doing over there? And how do you do that? And why do you do this? And, and the meal became nearly secondary to everybody watching me, which is when I, I think I probably started to look at maybe wanting to be a teacher and, and learn how to to teach. How lucky for all of those young chefs who will have a Chef Dara for their teacher. Thank you all for joining us once again and before I go I wish to thank our sponsors the Leonis Vinery and Villa de la Vine. Through my nonprofit organization and help of individuals like yourself, I promise to continue to produce quality program to help rebuild American families and fight childhood obesity. Once again, thank you for watching and until the next gathering, please take good care of yourself and those around you.